do this. Let's talk about talk. Hey there, I'm your communication coach, Dr. Andrea Wojnicki. Please call me Andrea. Welcome to Talk About Talk. Talk About Talk is the communication skills focused podcast for lifelong learners and for folks who are seeking to get noticed and advance their careers. Does that sound like you? Well, you're in the right place. Sure, some people make communication skills look easy, but it's not easy. It takes practice and it takes know-how. Talk About Talk gives you the know-how on things like storytelling, communicating with confidence, and networking. Today's episode's a bit different. We're going to focus on general communication skills. I'm going to share with you 10 things that I learned only because of my experience in producing these podcasts. After 60 episodes, I've learned so much. It's crazy how much I've learned. To be honest with you, a few months ago, I was feeling quite proud when I hit 50 episodes with Talk About Talk. I wanted to do something to commemorate that milestone. So I opened a new document and I started listing the communication skills that I've learned from podcasting. And here we are. This is a list of 10 communication insights that, well, I think are really cool. Not just for podcasters, but for anyone who wants to up their communication skills. A few of these insights are things that I may have read or heard before, but they didn't fully resonate for me until I started podcasting. Other insights are things I never would have known if I hadn't started podcasting, and you might not know them yet either. All of them are things that are relevant beyond podcasting. I promise you're going to learn something helpful here. Are you ready? Okay, let's do this. 10 communication insights. The first is crutch words. Do you know what a crutch word is? You might be able to guess. It's a word that you use repeatedly to fill silence or to help you gather your thoughts. It's just generally out of habit. Sounds like, um, or hmm, are common crutch words in verbal communication. But crutch words aren't just in verbal or spoken communication. Fiction and nonfiction writers also use crutch words sometimes, to their detriment though. So words like well, or certainly, or absolutely, or literally can also be crutch words. Have you noticed how many people say literally lately? That's a crutch word. Crutch words can also be phrases like for what it's worth, or jargon, like outside the box. Crutch words are usually unnecessary. Basically, they're like filler. That's not good. But even worse, crutch words can be very, very annoying, especially when we repeat them frequently. We need to avoid using crutch words. Here's the thing with me and crutch words. Mine change with every episode. Because I do all of my own editing for these Talk About Talk podcasts, my own crutch words become apparent to me very quickly. So I make a conscious effort to avoid them. But then you know what happens? I have a new crutch word for the next episode. Oi. So that's the first communication insight that I got from podcasting. Crutch words. Avoid them. They're unnecessary and they're annoying. Got it? Okay, the second communication insight. Mirroring. More than half of the Talk About Talk podcast episodes to date have been interviews. When I edit these interviews, I notice that I mirror the interviewees. And they mirror me. Mirroring people's body language is a good thing if you want them to like you. I mean, I heard that before I started podcasting. But this is different. This is a podcast. You can't hear body language. I'm talking about mirroring a person's tone or their cadence or their language. So, for example, tone, like happy or sad or serious or funny. It makes sense that mood or tone is contagious, right? We mirror other people's tone. Tone is actually related to body language. You know, if someone leans in, you lean in. If they sit up straight, so do you. Well, when a person is smiling and funny, I find myself smiling and maybe even trying to crack a joke. Or if they're monotone, I might mirror that. There's also language in terms of mirroring. So if one person uses formal language, the other person might do the same. And even words. If someone uses a unique word, they introduce that word into the conversation, you might then use that same word. Generally, mirroring is a good thing. It flatters the other person. Have you ever used a unique or uncommon word in a conversation and then the other person uses that word? I've become a lot more conscious of this now. It flatters the person who said it first. It tells them, not only I'm listening, 
but also I concur with your words. I shared this insight recently with someone who works in sales and he said, wow, you know what? You're right, I'm gonna use that. So that's the second insight. First, we had crutch words, and then we had mirroring. The third insight is contractions. No, I am not talking about giving birth. I'm talking about contractions in words. This is a really interesting one. It's also very simple. Have you ever been listening to someone on a podcast or on the radio and you can easily tell that they're reading? It sounds unnatural somehow. You know what I mean? Maybe because they aren't pausing at the right time, or maybe it's because they aren't using contractions. When we write, we don't use a lot of contractions. We use full words, but we speak with contractions. We may write, do not, but we say don't. We write, you will, but we say, you'll. We write, cannot, but we say, can't. Do you get it? Now that I know this, I can tell when podcasters have a written script in front of them. So here's the learning. If you're writing a book, fine. Full words are great. But if you're writing a speech, use contractions, because that's how we speak naturally. Okay, moving on to lesson number four, interrupting. Of course, I've known for a long time it's impolite to interrupt. Podcasting, though, has taught me so much about interrupting. When you interrupt someone in a podcast interview, it becomes unintelligible, right? When you interrupt someone on a Zoom call, you actually hear nothing. Sometimes, though, when I'm conducting an interview, I might need to interrupt someone to get clarity on something they said or to redirect the conversation. Here's the insight. Use body language to signal that you need to interrupt. Whether you're on a Zoom call or face-to-face, -face, raise your finger or your hand or make a grand gesture like, wait, wait. It works. Trust me. It helps me keep interviews on track, and it's much more polite than talking over someone. Got it? Interrupt with body language, not by talking over people. Next, number five is filler comments. Here's another one that I hear all the time now on podcasts and radio interviews when I'm listening, and now you're going to hear it too. Let me back up. Most of the communication we do, especially when we're interviewing or being interviewed, is substantive content. It's the stuff we tuned in to hear, but some of it is just niceties. It's these niceties that I'm talking about here. Filler, totally unnecessary comments. The classic filler is at the beginning of an interview. Have you ever noticed that experienced interviewers never ask the interviewee how they are? Never. This might sound a bit brutal, but we're not tuning in to hear how your day's going. And furthermore, if someone asks, how are you? A pro will answer quickly and then move on to the content. Something like this. So, how are you? The answer? I'm great, and I'm really curious to hear what you have to say about astrophysics or whatever the topic is. This is how the experts quickly and politely pivot the conversation to the relevant topic. I hear this all the time now on podcasts and on the news. It's brilliant. The other filler comment that I hear when I'm interviewing people is, wow, that's a great question. Honestly, this always makes me smile. I wonder to myself, was that really a great question or are you just stalling before you answer the question? I'm sure people are saying it just to be nice or maybe they do mean it. Usually people say it just once, maybe twice in an interview. Beyond that, it becomes a crutch word, right? It's filler, it's a bad habit and they're stalling. Next. Insight number five, we're halfway through here now. Breathing. Of course, breathing is important. It comes up in so many contexts. And specifically in terms of communication, breathing helps us feel confident and it makes our voice sound better. Two years ago, when I participated in Seth Godin's podcasting fellowship, Seth gave us some great advice that I still act on 60 episodes later. Seth encouraged us to remind ourselves and our podcast guests no matter how experienced they are, to pause and take a slow, deep breath before answering every question. That way, we have a moment to think about our answer and our voice sounds better. Great advice. I remember early on interviewing Bradley Christensen, the amazing baritone opera singer. He's a tall guy and he has a big chest. And he talked about how the size of his chest means he has bigger lungs, which help him with breathing 
and his singing voice. And of course, it's all about breathing. That's the point here. Here's another thing that I learned about breathing. We need to project with our voice on the exhale. I first heard this from presentations expert Andrew Musselman. It makes sense, right? Take a deep breath and then project your voice on the exhale. So that's number six, breathing. The next communication insight I learned from podcasting isn't really a communication skill per se. It's more of an observation. And it's this, people love to talk. I was really nervous early on asking people to be a guest on my podcast. I was so nervous to ask a few of my favorite esteemed professors like Jerry Zaltman and Ellen Oster and Russell Belk and Darren Flynn or celebrities like Tosca Reno and others. All of the guests that I interviewed are incredibly successful and very, very busy in their careers. Yet all of these guests that I asked, every one of them said yes. Take the CEO of one of Canada's busiest hospitals, Dr. Joshua Tepper. Can I interview you for my podcast, Dr. Tepper? Yep, no problem. Wow, right? Here's the insight. People love to help others by getting their message out there, to share their expertise as it relates to communication. Of course, some of my guests have made it their mission to communicate, even about taboo topics, like how to talk about youth mental health with Nicole German, or how to talk to your grieving friends with Andrea Warnick. Almost 100% of the people that I asked said yes, right away. I only received one generic rejection from a PR firm. This was last year. I read a fantastic book related to communication. So I emailed the author gushing about how I devoured the book and inviting her to be a podcast guest. She didn't even reply to me. Her PR firm did. Nope. I was crushed. But you know what? We're okay. For the most part, people love to talk, and I'm very grateful to all of the amazing guests who have shared their communication expertise with us. It is such a privilege to pick these people's brains. I love it. I hope you can tell how much I love it. Okay, the next insight is also related to these amazing guests. Insight number eight is the power of network effects. I guess it's no surprise that the most popular, most downloaded Talk About Talk episodes are commonly searched topics and celebrity guests. But there's also a significant effect in terms of the guest sharing an episode with their network. I studied social network analysis lots in university, and you may recall me saying that my research focused on word of mouth, and word of mouth is certainly related to social networks. So of course, I understand the impact of networks. But I have to say, I have to admit, I was surprised at the effect of networks on podcast downloads. I really wasn't anticipating that. A few of the podcast guests went full throttle on social media and emailed the episode to their network. One guest told me that she uses our podcast as her business card. Others have the podcast highlighted as a feature on their LinkedIn page. For all of these episodes, downloads went way up. What I'd love to do is create a linear regression that predicts downloads. Any statistics nerds out there? I bet we could get a pretty accurate estimate on downloads from a few key factors, including the popularity of the topic, the celebrity status of the guest, and the network promotion that I do and that the guest does. And speaking of the power of networks, I also want to say that I've been blown away by the supportive network of podcasters out there. If you think about it, us podcasters, we're all competing for market share, share of ear, I guess. But so many podcasters are generous beyond what I could hope for. And there are many of you. But thanks in particular to David Nabinsky, Nadine Kelly, and Andre Carnero. Each of them has an amazing podcast, and each of them has supported and helped me immensely. David's podcast is about managing your portfolio career. Nadine's podcast is about yoga and women's health. And Andre's podcast is about SEO and Google AdWords. So they're all incredibly different but they all have a common generosity that I appreciate so much. The least thing I can do is share their podcast with you, my network. You can check out links to their awesome podcasts in the show notes for this episode on the talkabouttalk.com website. Okay, moving on. The ninth insight I learned is about the flow or the structure of episodes. This is one of those things that I knew about previously, but podcasting really brought this home. 
As I've told you many times, I love hearing from Talk About Talk listeners. Any feedback or ideas that you have, bring it on. Do you want to know what's one of the most common comments that I get? People love the way I summarize everything at the end of each episode. Do you remember back in grade school, or maybe it was in high school, when you were writing an essay outline? They encouraged us to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Sound familiar? I have this visceral, horrid memory of ignoring this advice when I was a doctoral student at Harvard, and it blew up in my face. It was one of the first times that I was presenting my academic research. I didn't want to bore anyone, so I thought I'd keep the punchline till the end. Big mistake. The senior faculty member who organized the talk stood up in the audience and said, Andrea, for God's sake, tell us where you're going. Oof, right. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So that's what I try to do with these podcasts. I tell you what you're going to learn, then I give you the material, then I summarize. And that leads to one of the most common unsolicited compliments that I get. Yes, of course I had to learn this the hard way. I was yelled at in front of my peers, but I got it. Thank you. And by the way, yes, I will summarize the 10 learnings again at the end of this podcast. Now we're on to the last insight. Number 10 is listening to yourself. You've probably heard this before, but it's so, so true. Listening to yourself, or better yet, watching yourself on video, is the best way to improve your communication skills. Listening to or watching yourself is the ideal way to internalize your presentation skill development areas, the things you need to work on, to identify and drop crutch words, for example, or to not interrupt by talking over someone. Of course, this ain't easy, but I have a bona fide reason to listen to myself. I edit every single podcast. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't listen to myself. Just this past week, I was interviewed by someone else who promised to send me the audio just after the interview. It took a while for me to click on this file and listen to it, so I know it's not easy. But I promise you, with all my might, listening to yourself and watching yourself is absolutely the fastest way to improve your communication skills. So, make an excuse to record yourself at a meeting or a presentation, and then force yourself to listen or watch. I promise you will learn things and you'll act on them, and you'll get better. I hope you'll try it. Okay, that's it. 10 communication insights that I learned thanks to podcasting. Each of these communication insights are things that can help all of us become better communicators. You can always reference this list in the show notes on the talkabouttalk.com website, but here they are again. And by the way, look at me, telling you what I told you. Number one is crutch words as in unnecessary words that you use repeatedly. Stop using crutch words. Number two, mirroring. Mirroring body language, tone, and words. It's flattering to be mirrored. And three, contractions. People use contractions for speaking and full words for writing. Not using contractions in spoken word is a dead giveaway that someone's reading a script. Number four, interrupting with body language. Of course it's rude to talk over someone, but if you need to interject, use body language to let them know. Number five, filler comments. These are the unnecessary comments. As in, how are you? And I know I sound cold, but again, that's not why we're listening. The other common filler comment, that's a great question. Really? Okay, number six, breathing. Take a deep breath before you answer a question and always project with your voice on the exhale. Number seven, people love to talk. Almost 100% of the amazing, talented, and very busy people that I invited to be guests on the Talk About Talk podcast enthusiastically said yes. People are probably more willing to share their expertise than you might think. Number eight, network effects. Of course, network effects are very impactful. Number nine, the flow or the structure, as in tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. I learned the hard way years ago, and now the Talk About Talk listeners are loving that flow. People love summaries. 
the Coles Notes, the Cheat Sheets. And last but definitely not least, number 10, listening to yourself. Listening to yourself is the fastest way to improve your communication skills. No, it's not fun. Most of us dread hitting play on a recording of ourselves, but it's probably the most efficient and effective way to learn. Okay, that's it. Except I wanna say thank you. Thank you for listening to Talk About Talk. I appreciate you and I appreciate all of your comments more than you know. If you want to get some free communication skills coaching from me, just sign up for the weekly newsletter. It's never more than once a week and it's never spammy. Just go to talkabouttalk.com to sign up or email me and I'll sign you up myself. I'm at Andrea at talkabouttalk.com. Thanks for listening and talk soon.